So, the moment you start the discussion on gender identity these days in your school, in your coworker, and if you're talking to a friend who is gender affirming, um, identity affirming paradigm, if he's coming or she's coming or they are coming from that background, then what they will label you immediately if you were going to say we don't affirm the gender, we only believe genders are two, what they will label you immediately? Homophobic, transphobic, bigot, hater, right? So let's, and you will be labeled to start with first. It means if you are writing a book as an author, people will just see the title of your book, they won't even open the book and they will label you, you are this or that. We are living in such a sensitive time. Even if you are speaking and there's a YouTube video, before even clicking it, they will just by looking at the thumbnail and the title, they will uh, pass judgment. So let's discuss this entire idea. Are we preaching hate by uh, staying firm to our principles? Because this is usually the question in the West, hate in and of itself is considered as a negative word, but it has certain connotations. Um, so let's just discuss the entire idea. And the entire formula which we have our self-imposed idol, I would say, uh, hate the sin, not the sinner. Have you ever heard this? How many of you um, agree with this idea that we should hate the sin, not the sinner? Can you raise your hand? No one? So we should, oh, one, okay. How many of you agree that we should hate the sin, but not the sinner? So there is one, two, two and a half, Okay, okay. let's start this, inshallah. Um, until 2015, um, I'm confessing this, that I used to say this, and now I realize that this is not appropriate. Um, and I can have my own logic, you can disagree with after 10, 15 minute argument. But I think now at this point, um, I personally think that this is not appropriate a statement for imams, for activists, for du'at, for Muslim people to say, hate the sin, not the sin. And I can give you my reasoning. Um, to identify from a Muslim Islamic standpoint something is true or false, what gauge we have? Quran and Sunnah, that's from rational perspective, or oh, reason, reason, rational perspective, oh no, that's from textual perspective, means we have Quran and Sunnah text, or logic, rational, right? So there is no ayah in the Quran and no hadith explicitly, unambiguously saying, hate the sin, not the sinner. From the rational standpoint, hate the sin, not the sinner. This is used all this time. Um, even I've seen so many Muslim speakers have used this, hate the sin, not the sinner, or hate the sin, love the sinner. Um, and especially in regard to LGBTQ. So now let's, let's deconstruct this entire argument. Let's assume that this is right. Hate the sin, not the sinner. Can you love or can you hate the rape but love the rapist can you do this no right i know subhanallah a few few months ago may allah protect our sons and daughters Amin ya Rab. a few months ago in in pakistan uh, one guy raped seven year old girl and then murdered her and threw her in dumpster and the parents were doing umrah and this is almost two three years so i guess five six years ago subhanallah now Think about it. Can we ask those parents, no, no, we have a principle, hate the sin, not the sinner. So you can hate the act of rape, but you don't have to hate the rapist. Is it even logical to ask this question? Does your heart will going to give witness that this is not logical? And furthermore, when it is not coming from Quran and Sunnah, so there is no point of defending this, this self-imposed principles. Absolutely. But now we'll see where this argument is coming from also, especially where it's revived. So even logically, it doesn't make sense. Can we just hate the oppression and love the oppressor? It's not impossible. They both are connected. Why, why we are differentiating between both? Yeah, if you want to differentiate, the differentiate, differentiation have to come from a Sharia compliance. And that's why we are discussing this. Furthermore, one more thing which will be interesting. Initially, I don't know who said this, there are different researches back in the days. Hey, this and this and was said by Mahatma Gandhi. Um, if you Google it, or it was said by Saint Augustine. There are different theories, but now it was revived in the Western civilization. Hey, this and this and by by churches in 80s and 90s. Churches, especially Lutheran church, not no surprises, right? 
they started using this, hey, this is not the sinner, to welcome same-sex marriage. That we hate the sin, not the sinner. It means we accept you as a sinner and we will change our laws and succumb. That's, that's the idea. So now you know how it is connected to even LGBTQ. So now immediately when people call you, you are a hater because you're going against my identity and we go into the defense mode. No, 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 we are not hating anyone. Think about it, think about it. Um, let me give you the entire discussion on this and then let's change the strategy. Let's go one by one on this, inshallah. Um, so from the Islamic standpoint, is there any evidence in the Quran or in the Hadith where I can differentiate between the act or the actor or sin or the sinner? Is there any Hadith? Actually, it's the other way around. There are so many Hadith. I mentioned this in my book. I will mention a few. Rasulullah said in a Hadith, a fornicator, Zani, a fornicator, when he fornicates, so act and actor are mentioned both. A fornicator, when he fornicates, they are not in the state of Iman. So Rasulullah says an actor when he is performing an haram action, he is not in the state of Iman. So Rasulullah didn't differentiate between the act and the actor, the sin and the sinner, the fornicator and the fornication. How are we doing this? It's not even Sharia compliant. Maybe in the process of trying to please our Western or friends, we are actually leaving the paradigm of Islam. Right? Remember the first session we had, fixing square pegs and circle hole? We don't need to do this. There are many other hadith which actually says other way around. Okay, well, there is one more hadith. How would you reconcile with this principle where Rasulullah Sallallahu says, Man ahabba lillahi wa abghada lillahi wa mana'a lillahi wa ata lillahi wa qad istakmala liman. Aw qama qala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam akhrajahu Abu Dawud fi tirmiz, fi sunani. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whoever loves anyone, he loves for the sake of Allah. You know this hadith, right? But in America, we don't listen to the other part of the hadith. Because it's all about love is love, right? The other part of the hadith, whoever loves someone, he loves for Allah. And whoever hates someone, he hates for Allah. And then hadith says, whoever prevents something from someone, he does for Allah. And if he gives something to someone, it's for Allah, then Rasulullah says his iman is complete. May Allah SWT complete our iman. Ameen, Ya Rab. Now the question is, where you will take this hadith if you will apply this, hate the sin, not the sinner? Because in this paradigm, you are saying, I am not supposed to hate anyone. From the individual standpoint, you are hate, supposed to hate the action, but not the actor if you are a believer of hate the sin, not the sinner. Are we following? So, either you can take the hadith or you can take this self-imposed liberal idol principle. There, so there is something wrong with this. I will come to the synthesis of this, but there is something wrong with this pr entire proposal. So we have to deconstruct and make it Sharia compliant. Now, I know that the problem comes with the English language and the English usage of the word hate. Because when we say man abghada lillah in the hadith, whoever hates someone for Allah, his iman is complete. When you translate this word in English as hate, the word hate in English language, is it used for positive connotation or usually negative connotation? That's where the problem is. So the problem is in the translation, not in the entire concept. Because every culture we hate something and we like something. Isn't it? As an American, you might hate something, you might like something. And we'll come to that argument later. So I do understand that in English language, because the word hate usually entails harm, like hate crime. Hate crime, crime is usually associated with hate, so hate crime. So when you use the word hate, it's hate to have a negative connotation. So maybe the better translation, better translation would be religious hate, not the English negative connotation of the hate. And we can differentiate between both. Because religious hate does not entail harm, it just have a strong dislike from the heart. Or you can use a strong dislike also, but strong dislike for that, it's, there is a word in Arabic. The word abghada lillah, that have to have something, a strong, very strong dislike. Okay, one very important thing, and you will find it really interesting. You can Google it, hating evil. Hating evil, by McCormick, I'll give you the name, exact name, it's in my book, uh, in the footnotes. He did write a paper 
on why it is important to hate the sinner and the sin both. If they are evil, according to him. And he's not a Muslim, by the way. And he said this, that if you are not hating the evil, whether it's coming from a person or from a product or commodity, there is a chance that you will get desynthesized and you will get involved in that hate, in that evil. So it is important for you to show extreme dislike in your heart for that evil thing, whether it's coming from person or from a commodity, so that you won't get involved in this. And this should remind you about one hadith. You remember which hadith comes in your mind? Which hadith comes in your mind? Anyone? That at least in your heart you should feel. Yeah? Uh, I can't hear you, brother. Yes, 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 mashallah. Marra min gum fal yugayir biyadi. Fa illam yastate fa bi lisani. Fa illam yastate fa bi qalbi. And then, this is not the ideal. Wadalika ada aful iman. Rasulullah says in Sayyid Muslim, if you see an evil, change it with your hand. If you don't have authority like political authority, if you're living as a minority, then what are our options? Fa illam yastate fa bi lisani. Then with your tongue. If, even if you don't have that authority, at least in your heart, have a desire to change it. How can you accept that evil thing and start loving it? It means that Rasulullah says, if, even if you are considering that evil in your heart as an evil, this is the lowest level of Iman. And if you were to stop considering that evil as an evil in your heart, it means you don't even have lowest level of Iman. Right? And this is very natural, by the way. Um, I know most of you are young people. I'm assuming you are not married. May Allah Taala give you a good spouse and righteous spouse. Amin, Ya Rab. So let's say if you are in love with someone, halal love, Sharia compliant love, um, you would do everything what your loved one love. And you would avoid all those things which your loved one dislikes. Right? And that's what Ibn Qayyim says. Our relationship with Allah should be like this. Right? Okay, this is the entire thesis of it. Now let's come to the other extreme and then we'll come up with the synthesis, uh, how to put this in together. <coughs> Someone might ask, Imam Asif, what, what's, the, what's wrong with it? What's the problem? Why can't we teach absolute love? This entire discussion is very philosophical. Just teach absolute love. Why we even have to start this discussion? What's, what's the problem? Then what will be the argument? Tell me. Why can't we teach absolute love? Why we have to go with this conditional love and this? Why don't you teach absolute love? No hate at all. Why can't we teach that? Tell me. Tell me. I gave you a few arguments already. Few I didn't give. Tell me. Okay. So, how can you teach absolute love? Absolute love means I have to love absolutely all the rapists, all the murderers, all the criminals. Should I do that? Absolutely, it's not possible. So absolute love is not possible in any civilization, in any religion, in any philosophy. It's not possible. It's not logical at all. Second, in Islam, are we egocentric or Allah-centric? So we will like something what Allah likes and we will dislike something what Allah dislikes. Every culture imposes on its citizens, or every country imposes on its citizens, certain social ethical norms if you go beyond the, those norms you will be a disliked person in that society it's not about absolute hate absolute evil right in islam we are saying we are not egocentric or human centric we are allah centric allah will decide those things allah will decide the social ethical norms if you go against that i will hate you for the sake of allah not for personal issues is that clear third Instead of absolute love or absolute hate, we will do conditional love and conditional hate. So if I am hating someone or strongly disliking someone for one particular evil act, this is not absolute hate, this is conditional hate. Maybe I have to love the same person for some other good deeds. This is very different than absolute hate, right? And this is very logical also. Furthermore, this hate this hate, which we are saying that this should be a religious hate, doesn't include any harm, as I just mentioned. Now, if you combine everything, combine everything, now what's the synthesis 
of not going to the extreme of hate the sin, not the sinner, because it's illogical, there is no evidence from the Quran, and, Sunnah, and teaching absolute love. What's, what's the middle ground? Wallahu alam, what's the middle ground? I know we have to love people even though we are hating them because we have to bring them back. Didn't Rasulullah made dua for the people of Taif? Yes, last night uh, Sheikh Laisi was discussing this. Didn't Rasulullah made dua for the people in Uhud when his teeth was broken? So now what is the fine balance? Because hate the sin, not the sinner is not working at all. The fine balance would be that I do have to strongly dislike the person who is acting in an evil way, but there is a difference. So the difference would be, and you can write this down, this is a little philosophical, that hate of the sin, hate of the sin is hate of the hater. Again, hate of the sin is hate of the hater. And hate of the hater is hate of the, uh, hate of the sinner, sorry, hate of the sinner is hate of the lover. I'll tell you again and I'll give you example. Hate of the sin is hate of the hater. And hate of the sinner is hate of the lover. So for example, if I see my son doing drugs, if a mother see her son doing drugs, when she will see drugs, she will hate out of hate. But when she will see her son, she will hate her son, but it is out of love because he, she wants her to leave doing drugs. And she will say, I hate you doing drugs. I hope one day will come and you will leave this because I love you, you'll come back inshallah. But you know what postmodern society is teaching us? Oh, you are a hater until you affirm me. So however I am, you have to accept me, you have to love me, even if it's in your hermeneutical system of religion, it, show, it tells that you have to hate the evil. But you have to love me completely in an absolute sense. Well, they don't love you by even in an absolute sense, but they are asking you to love them in an absolute sense. And we cannot go to a consistent definition if you will say with hate this and not this. You know why? We are living in a country where people are worshipping themselves. In this society, someone might label me, if I will teach my kids genders are binary, someone in this society will label me transphobic, yes? If I will teach in this society, that homosexuality is haram, someone will label me as homophobic, yes? And I will label them Islamophobic for labeling me homophobic and transphobic, yes? So where are the consistent rules which will going to bring peace and unity and uniformity in life? It have to be divine revelation which this society have thrown out of the window and now even reason. <laughs> you remember the first lesson? So now everything goes back to feeding and that's why we are in this disaster. So this is the entire um, synthesis of when someone accuses you of, are you preaching hate? We are not preaching hate, we are preaching you divine guidance and matched with the rationality and reason. If you don't agree with it, yes, I will going to dislike that because I love for my fellow brothers in the human family what I love for myself as a Muslim. If you don't accept, that's up to you. But I do want you to accept this because this is a better lifestyle. Instead of saying, no, no, I don't, I don't do, I, I love you, love for all, love, love, love is love. That, that is not our paradigm. And honestly speaking, that is, not, that is not the practical paradigm for them also. They will hate you for not loving them. <laughs> so <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, right? But yeah, this is uh, the entire paradigm. The reason why I'm saying this, whenever I spoke about LGBTQ, even yesterday uh, with the youth session, uh, day before yesterday, even in Ellen Masjid, uh, even in New York and Houston and other masajid, the number one argument which comes is, oh, but we have to hate the sin, not the sinner. Where this argument came from? There is no ayah in the Quran, no hadith. Just one thing last before we can start Ibrahim alayhi salam. Someone might say, didn't Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi love or give witness to the, that person's love for him who was drinking liquor? You know the hadith? Or there was one person who used to drink companion after his as prohibition and he would drink and he would come in the gathering of Rasulullah that Rasulullah please make dua, or, please make tawbah for me, Rasulullah make tawbah and then again he will go back, again he will come. A point came when a sahaba said, Il'an ya Rasulullah, curse this man ya Rasulullah, curse this man, he is not giving importance to your tawbah and you know what Rasulullah said, 
إِنَّهُ يُحِبُّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ How can I curse this man? He loves Allah and his messenger. Some people use this hadith as an argument of hate and not the sinner. What's the problem with this? That person, was he pers did he persist with his sin or he was coming for repentance? He was coming for repentance. So no one disagree that we have to love all the people who wants to come back to repent and repent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are talking about the person who will persist with his sinful lifestyle, evil lifestyle, and he will impose on you and your kids. And they would chant like, we are here, we are queer, we are here for our children. Did you see that rally? Allahu Akbar, Allah Nusra. And still, if you will say, this is my lifestyle, they will label you hater. How can you do the analogy between them and the Sahaba who's, who was coming for Tawbah and a better lifestyle? Means I know you are making an effort to reconcile Islam with liberalism, but maybe you're going too far, Habibi. <laughs> it's not reconcilable. It's not reconcilable. Is that clear? I guess this should be clear, inshallah. Okay. Now let's come to the point of uh, just two examples from Ibrahim alayhi salam, which is related to our uh, entire discussion. How many of you have heard finding your true self? This entire idea, finding your true self, be yourself. How many of you have heard this? Do you know where this comes from? Okay. Just do the Google search. According to my little research, as this concept as we use in Western civilization, according to my little research, it came from Jack Russo. Um, he, um, he wrote the entire, bo um, entire uh, book on this, um, uh, and one of his chapters is about finding a true self. Um, I gave a reference um, about this in my book in chapter three. You can look at for more information, but I'll talk about only two things and I'll be done, inshallah. So, Let's see first from the, um, from the Islamic angle um, about finding your true self. Uh, this person, Jacques Rousseau, is very interesting, by the way. 18th century scholar. He came up with, uh, uh, he had a very weird background. Many motivational speakers today are actually using his saying. Um, one of his saying was, um, man is born free, yet he is surrounded by the chains. It should remind you, oh, okay, man, he's talking about a person breaking the shackles, coming out, finding his true self, right? Wait a minute. See his lifestyle, how he defined freedom. So he says, man is born free, yet he's surrounded by chains. If you will see his lifestyle, he had five kids. How many? Five kids. In the childhood, they, he sent all those five kids to orphanage. Because he said, I do not want this restriction. It will limit my freedom. <clears throat> so it's better sometime to check the philosopher's lifestyle also. With Rasulullah Sallallahu you won't find this. Lima taquluna wa la This is not the case for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahu Akbar. His life, his words, his action, completely reconcilable. Subhanallah. That's, that's the beauty of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and other prophets. Okay. And he became the central figure by the even French Revolution. But anyway, coming back to this. Um, according to him, according to him, when he said, find your true self, be yourself, find your true authentic self, you know what he meant? If you see his word. Okay, what comes in your mind when, when people say, be yourself, find your true authentic self, what comes in your mind? Tell me. I have seen Muslim speakers, means I'm tier 5 speaker. I have heard tier A and tier B speakers also using, be your true self, be your authentic self. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're using from a Sharia compliant version. But what does it mean when you guys are using, be yourself, man? What does it mean? Tell me. Yes. Yes, follow your desires. Just give your desires or your feeling primary authority. Whatever you want to be, just be. Abolish anything outside, right? That's what. Okay, so that's a good point. That's I would say that's a little bit Sharia compliant thing. Um, so that's not Jack's Russo, by the way. That's so. If I will say to my son Abdurrahman, be Abdurrahman, not be Abdullah, like this. Okay, that that's 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 a good way of looking at it. Be yourself. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's a, that's a more uh, Sharia compliant version, but you know Jack's Russo said in the same way as uh, Sheikh Ammar said. You have to be yourself. It means, according to Jack Russo, who introduced this, he said, you have to abolish the morality of outside, including religion, 
because religion can impact and corrupt your feelings. Religion can tell you this is halal or this is haram. You have to abolish every morality, every religion, every God, and just be yourself means act on your feeling. That's what it means when they say, be yourself, according to Jacques Rousseau. And when an atheist person, a anti-theist person, a godless person is using this argument, most of the time it is in the context, just be yourself. It means you don't have to give any regard to any, rev any revelation, religion, act on your feelings, act on your desire. Sometimes a coaches uh, in these sports use this argument, just be yourself, express yourself without any fear. It means what obviously in the, in the coaching sense is different, sports is different. But in real life, you don't have to have any fear of any outside authority. In Islam, we say, we believe that whatever we do, we have to have the consequences of Allah and Akhirah and our soul in mind, which is entire culture have deleted that. So just keep this in mind. Okay, now let's come to Islam from the Islamic angle. What does Allah say about finding your true self? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the closest ayah which I, I could found actually is this ayah. Um, Allama Muhammad Iqbal, one of the famous poet in, in Indo-Pak uh, before, the, before they made even Pakistan and Bangladesh. Uh, he died in 1940. He actually said this ayah talk, talking about finding true self. Um, so it's, he said, Allah says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ and be not, be not like those who forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he made them forget themselves. Do you want to find your true self? Allah says, if you will do this, if you want to find your true self, by disregarding Allah, Allah as a punishment will give you a punishment in Akhirah, that's for sure. In dunya, you cannot even be true to yourself. Fansahum <laughs> and fusahum. As a punishment, Allah made them forget from themselves. Because our purpose of life, as Sheikh recited, We can only find our true self, our true authentic self, our true purpose of life, our true meaning of life, our true objective of life, by submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you remove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can you find your true self without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this has pretty un-Islamic roots when we say finding your true self, be authentic to yourself. Why I'm bringing this up? Ibrahim alayhi salam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him, you remember? To leave his family in the middle of desert where the only thing which is waiting for Ibrahim and his family is death, apparently. He loved his son, he loved his son, he loved his wife, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's instruction, even though apparently, logically, he cannot get proper rationalization. Why? What's the benefit of this? But Allah is asking him to do something. Did he act it on his feeling? No, no, I have to find my true self. Or did he say, no, I have to do what Allah SWT is saying? Did he find his true self for, according to Jack Russo? Or did he say, no, I will follow Allah SWT even if it goes against my feeling, my logic, my rationale? Second test. Ibrahim didn't have a son for a long time. Then Allah SWT gave him a son. And then. After 13 to 14 years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Ibrahim Islam to give that son back. Now, first of all, ask a father how much you love your son or daughter. Especially if Allah have given you that son or daughter after a long time. You will see that father and mother is taking extra care for that ch child. And after 13, 14 years, when you can see that my son can... Uh, you can see the optimism and hope that my son can carry my message of prophethood because he was a prophet. And then Allah says, just slaughter your son. It's a test. Should I go with my love? Should I go with my emotions? Should I go with my feelings? Should I find my true authentic self? Disregard any morality? Or should I just follow Allah's instructions? What did Ibrahim did? Whenever, whenever, whenever Allah tested Ibrahim al -Islam between his feeling and his God's instructions, what Ibrahim selected? Allah's instructions. Aslam tuli Rabbil Alameen. Every time he says, I surrendered. I surrendered what? Tell me. I surrendered what? Myself. What you are saying. Myself, my choice, my freedom, my feeling. I submit. I surrender to your divine instructions. This entire Western civilization is making you egocentric because you are thinking about self-centric, egocentric personalities. 
And Islam is saying, come back and make yourself and your feelings and your freedom and your choice subservient to divine guidance. Extremely important. Whatever decision you are making in your Western civilization, ask yourself, is, is it for myself or is it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is removed in this civilization. You know, one of the famous scholars, it's, it will come in Tazkiyah class, Sahal at tustari um, in, in the Tazkiyah books, he was asked that what is the most difficult thing on your ego? He was asked, he was around the time of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He was asked, what is the most difficult thing on your ego? Anyone can guess what his, what his response was? What is the most difficult thing for your ego to digest? Ayyu shay ashaddu ala nafs. Nafs hina yani ananiya, ego. Tell them. I just explain, I, I will explain more what you are saying. He said, sincerity. Sincerity is the most difficult thing on my ego. And he was asked, how? Because your ego will say everything is for you. Sincerity say everything is for Allah. So there is constant fight between sincerity, ikhlas, and ego. You will do any good thing for the sake of Allah, ego will say, take the credit. Ikhlas and sincerity will say, don't take credit, give the credit back to Allah. So put the self, put the ego, don't crush it, that's Christian virgin. Put the ego onto its place, because if there is no ego, there is no you. <laughs> we all want to go to Jannah, right? That's ego. We want to save ourselves, right? We want to save ourselves from hell. But don't crush it, but put the ego under the divine guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, we'll cover this in Tazkiyah class. Okay, final thing before we can end. Final thing before we can end. I just mentioned briefly um, in um, uh, yesterday or uh, day before yesterday in the Khatara. You know, everything have a body and soul. You remember that first or second class discussion? Um, I have a body and I have a soul. Which one is Asif Hirani at this point? Both. But when my soul will be taken away, Asif Hirani will be taken away. Then you will say, oh, Salatul Janazah is after Asr. Did body arrive? Did body go to cemetery? Asif Hirani is gone. Even though the same body is here. Right? And you are going to bury the body of Asif Hirani. And then body will be decomposed. And then gone. So even though we will say body and soul both are important. Both are used for identity. But which one is everlasting? And that is soul. In terms of the root. Soul. Okay. We can, Imam Ghazali says we can use the same analogy. And I'm coming to the sacrifice. Even for the ibadat, salah, have the body and salah have the soul. Body can be seen, soul cannot be seen. What is the body of the salah? Tell me. Sajda is the body or soul? Apparently. Body. You are doing sajda, you are doing ruku, you are raising the hand, you are putting the hands here, whatever. That's body. What is the soul, unseen thing within salah? Hushu, connection. Can you see connection? No. That's a soul. Okay. If you miss a sajda ruku, you have to do sajda sahab. If you don't get khushu, which we won't get, you won't have to perform sajda sahab, right? That's why less emphasis is on soul, ruh, because it's from the unseen. And we are living in such a materialistic society, entire focus is on the body. So soul is ignored. Similarly, is the meaning of Quran more important or the pronunciation? By the way, both are more important. If you're reciting Quran incorrectly, then fix your tajweed. But in terms of comparison, meanings of the Quran is more important or the pronunciation if, if, you, if one have to give in priority. You can say, La'anatullahi ala al kathibin Allah will curse the liars with beautiful tajweed, with all different maqamat. But if you are still lying, you are a loser. <laughs> right? Because one is the body, one is the soul. One is seen, one is from the unseen. Similarly, we can apply the same logic. And this is where I want to end. Same logic on the ulhiya. When you do the sacrificing of the animal, one thing is the body, one thing is the soul. What is the body? Tell me, animal, how you sacrifice, how sharp your knife should be. Uh, the entire book of fiqh actually discusses this. The kinds of the animal which are permissible and whether you have to trim the nails. Is it haram? Is it uh, makruh? 
uh, all that entire, that entire scene world is the body of the sacrifice. How much meat you have to distribute to the poor and what is the soul of sacrifice? <laughs> Tell me. Hmm? Why? Why I'm sacrificing an animal? Obviously, one is historical fact. We know we are reviving the legacy of Ibrahim a.s. But Ibrahim a.s. loved his son. Yes or no? But still Allah asked him, he slaughtered his beloved thing to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Almost. Until Allah replaced that with an animal. Alhamdulillah is not asking us to do that. Allah is asking us to slaughter an animal. Now, when we are sacrificing an animal, this is a soul of udhiyya, soul of sacrifice. You should ask yourself, day after tomorrow, that's Wednesday, that what are I, what am I sacrificing? What is my sacrifice? What is my Ismail? Who is my Ismail? And this is a question we all should ask. If I have a bad habit of something, and obviously I'm addicted towards that because I love that, because of my passions, my sexual desire, I'm sorry to use this word, I'm, uh, because of my physical desire, whatever. If I'm addicted towards it, it means I love that, but it's harmful for me. It's stopping me to become a decent person. That is something which I should put knife on, on 10th of Zulhijjah. I know some of you, not all, I know some of you are bad, have a bad habit of smoking. That is the best time, day after tomorrow, to make a commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will stop doing drugs, smoking, drinking, even weed. Then move for, forward. I know some of you are addicted towards certain shameless websites. You don't need to raise your hand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows you. And inshallah, Allah will give you strength to come out of this inshallah. But that is the best time. To put the knife on that inner animal. This inner animal, which we all have, this inner monster usually comes out when we lock the door. When no one sees us, right? That is a time to slaughter that animal that I don't want you to come out because I will slaughter you completely. This is a soul of Eid al-Adha. What have you sacrificed? Ask yourself. Anything which disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and which is beloved to you, you need to sacrifice. That is my Ismail. For some older, older folks, maybe it's the abuse in relationship, maybe it's backbiting, whatever. If, if, if your sleep, if you love your sleep and your sleep is, is stopping you to pray Salat al-Fajr, slaughter your sleep. Because that's beloved to you. You cannot even... <laughs> Pick the blanket because you love so much. Slaughter your sleep. Change your schedule. Bring a positive change. Become a decent person. Slaughter bad habits. That is the sign that you have achieved the soul of Udhiyya. Is that clear, brothers and sisters? So, homework for tonight that write one bad habit. Write. Because what you write, you will make more, pay more attention to it. Write that one bad habit. And then you can delete it so that no one can see that. <laughs> write that bad habit and work towards leaving that. Make practical approaches. Ask your mentors, ask one or two friends, I want to do this, I know you have left this bad habit, how? And then work towards it, inshallah, so that we can achieve the soul of Udhiyya, inshallah. Is that clear? Jazakumullah karan. Any questions so far? Today's discussion was extremely easy. There was no philosophical discussion, inshallah. Um, okay. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa